Okay, class, welcome back. In this unit, we'll be covering the phases of the cardiac action potential. This basically describes the physiological events that must occur at the membrane in our cardiac conduction cells to allow for the cardiac action potential to begin, as well as to propagate down the, the conduction system. Um, I'm not expecting anyone to walk away here with a PhD in electrophysiology, but to understand key events and key movements of ions across the membrane that allow these events to occur. To orient ourselves here, we're going to kind of go over the, um, the axes. So on the x-axis, we have time. Again, these events will be occurring in, sequ in uh, sequential order and succession of each other. And then our y-axis, we have the membrane potential, a transmembrane potential. Um, again, uh, which is the potential, the, different, the gradient of ions, basically, or charges um, from the intercellular uh, fluid to the extracellular fluid, right? Um, so we've got five key phases, phase zero through four, um, and they all have slightly different events that occur. Phase four, you can think of when the, uh, the ionic concentrations are back to their normal baseline level, um, and the potential is back to its normal resting potential, or it's stable, which is at negative 90 millivolts. So again, we start the action potential at this phase, and then at the end, we go back to it. And we'll go over what, what allows that occur later on. The first phase of the cardiac action potential is actually phase zero which is the genesis of the upstroke, depolarization of the membrane moving from negative 90 to negative 65, and that occurs similar to other areas and other types of act potentials through the opening of voltage-gated, again, voltage-gated sodium channels. Again, a form of passive transport, no energy. The gating that causes those channels to open is the transmembrane potential, okay? Um, and then that opens up slow, ca uh, slow calcium channels and, and we move down the phase and we'll get into kind of how things go step by step. So again, phase four is the resting or rest membrane potential. The cells are in a resting phase. They're back at negative 90 millivolts, which is that resting membrane potential. And then um, the cells are basically ready to receive the electrical stimulus, right? Phase zero is the genesis of the upstroke. We have that move, right? Looking at this here, right? And we have that, you know, once we get, you know, up um, to negative 65, we have that, you know, influx. So depolarization of the membrane goes from negative 90 to negative 65. Again, remembering when we have depolarization, the cells don't really get like positive, they become less negative because right, we have an influx of sodium channel of sodium ions. Um, the fast sodium channels open, then the slow calcium channels open. It increases sodium conductance by opening subsequent sodium channels. We have, a, we have the influx of sodium channels calls of that rapid uptick, as we call it the upstroke. And then the soul begins the, the cell begins to depolarize and then you know eventually begins to contract. We have the sharp, tall upstroke of the action potential, which looks like any action potential. You guys remember this from um, physiology, or right? like basic physiology, nervous system physiology. Phase one is the genesis of early repolarization. Okay, that's caused by activation of the outward potassium current. Right. So again, it's kind of an example of like how these different ions are moving across. Again, sodium um, will typically influx in. To the cell, potassium will efflux out of the cell. Okay, um, the contraction is still in process. The cells, but begins this early, rapid partial repolarization because the sodium channels open faster than the potassium channels. Um, so they've opened um, first. The potassium channels will then open, and we'll start seeing a slight efflux, right, of potassium, um, which causes that. Um, little, where's that little, let's go back, that little dip here, right? The potassium channels open, right? And we, um, the efflux of sodium, or sorry, potassium begins. Phase two, right, which is the genesis of a plateau. 
So we start having an influx of the influx of calcium is counterbalanced by the efflux of potassium. And then it's the end of contraction, right? Contraction ceases after this point, and then the cells begin to relax, right? And you can look at this graphically here. It's this point where, again, the, the influx of calcium is balanced by the outflux, right, of potassium, right? They're balanced out to each other. Then phase three, which is the genesis of final repolarization, all right, it's when the efflux of potassium um, uh, exceeds the influx of calcium. It's when phase three begins, and you can see this by the you know the the, the cell membrane potential starting to return back right to its resting potential negative ninety, right? So again. Phase four is the beginning. The, the channels for sodium and calcium um, are closed. As the cell begins to depolarize, the action potential reaches it. We have the opening of the sodium channels. They open fast. Influx of sodium causes the member potential to you know, move to less negative. Phase one, the transient Potassium channels open, allow for some potassium to efflux, which causes that slight little dip down, phase one. Phase two, um, we've got calcium is balanced by potassium, so we have a level plateau. And then in phase three, the ch calcium channels close, or you know, even before that happens, the efflux of potassium is greater than calcium, and we start to move back towards that resting potential to more negative. So again, phase three to phase four, um, and in phase four, we get back that resting member potential. But again, phase three, final repolarization, when we're getting back to where calcium is exceeding the, the, the efflux of, efflux of potassiums exceeding the influx of calcium. The calcium channels themselves begin to close and we just have potassium being pumped or effluxing out. And then we get back to, or start moving into phase four, which we're at resting membrane potential. Again, so easy way to remember it. Again, the start we've got, we have sodium entering in phase zero. That's the big event. In phase one, we have potassium leaving Phase two, calcium and potassium are balanced, so we have a plateau. Phase three, calcium channels begin to close as well. Potassium channels are still open, and we start moving back towards negative or more negative to our resting potential. Easiest way to remember it. And then in phase four, we restore the ionic concentrations using the typical sodium potassium pumps, which we've covered in the first unit. And again, um, they get back to that resting potential to receive another impulse, right? And we repeat this cycle over and over and over again, um, again, to, to keep coordinated beating. So let's go over that again. Phase zero, we have a rapid influx, right? Due to the sodium channels opening, allowing sodium to enter into the cell, right? The membrane potential becomes less negative, moves towards zero. We have an upward spike, right, in the transmembrane potential. Phase one, the potassium channels begin to open. They open slower. They open slower pretty much everywhere in the body than the sodium channels. So it's a little delay there, right? They start effluxing or start leaving the cell. We had that slight dip at the end of phase zero into phase one. At phase two, right, the sodium channels are closed. The calcium channels are still open. The potassium channels are still open. We have a balance, right, of charges or, or flux. Calcium moving in is balanced by calcium, potassium moving out. We have our plateau. Phase three, the calcium channels have have either beginning to close or are closed. 
and then the potassium channels are still open because then they move slow, the cell membrane potential begins to become more negative, moves away from zero until we return to the resting membrane potential in phase four again, which is balanced again the last little bit by the sodium potassium pumps, which do require energy. Why this is important to know is again, if you look at the ECG, basically this occurs at the same similar process at every single part of the heart. This is just kind of what, what it looks like in general. And when we add and summate all these waves together, it's actually what produces the ECG wave. We'll learn more about this later on when we get into the ECGs, but this is a review again of the key you know, movements of ions across the membrane, the, the five key phases um, of the electrical or cardiac action potential. Um, great, and this is basically why, you know, someone who has a heart attack, why things can get kind of dangerous in terms of dysrhythmias, because we lose supply of blood, glucose, oxygen, we talked about how the heart uses oxidative phosphorylation. We also just talked about how the, the, for pumping and muscle contraction. We also talked about that it needs ATP to reset the cycle. There's a term called myocardial stunning that occurs when we have an infarction or, or ischemia um, where the heart doesn't move as well because it can't, it's basically trapped because um, it can't reset the cycle because we lose the ATP pumps to restore ionic concentrations across the transmembrane potential, um, and we can't re restart the cardiac cycle. Um, so that's why it, it can be very, very dangerous for a lot of different reasons um, to lose blood supply to the heart. Again, blood supplies all the substrate, um, which is important for muscle contraction, right? Um, we talked about the slow stroke and fast stroke. It's also super important for uh, stabilizing membrane potentials too. So not only does the heart not you know, restart the power stroke because of the loss of ATP, it also loses ATP. We can't rebalance the ion uh, potentials, the transmembrane potentials, because we lose the ATP um, needed to, to fuel the sodium potassium pump. So again, again, if you understand the physiology, you understand what you're looking at. And again, this is an example of that same event that we're seeing in different areas. The one we really covered is primarily what we see at the ventricles. We focus more on the ventricles in terms of cardiac physiology, because again, like that's kind of the, like the big, <laughs> the big event, right? That's what pumps blood throughout the heart. Um, but it looks almost identical um, in different areas. SNO looks slightly different. I'm not going to dive too deep into that. But again, if you remember this, this here especially, right? That's what we're really getting into. And again, uh, like we talked about um, in looking at how the cells depolarize, right? Remembering the mean vector generally um, will move from right to left because we start the SA node, we propagate, you know, across the, to the to the to the left side and then down into the ventricles. Um, and then also important to remember the ventricles when they depolarize, like we mentioned, because of the way the Purkinje fiber is kind of oriented, they depolarize from inside out. The deeper fibers moving out to the um, epicardium, and they tend to repolarize outside in. This will get more important when we start looking at the T waves on ECGs and why they're in the same direction as the R waves or the QRS complexes. Um, but it's remembering that the, the, the ventricles depolarize from inside out, you know, subendocardium, right, to the epicardium. Just remember that key point. And then the, the flow of current generally that vector moves in this direction. So again, why this is important too, the electrical events cause all the mechanical events, right? They, they precede them. So here's an example, kind of a, a, a snippet from the, the Wiggers diagram, which we'll, we'll cover later on, which shows how these things work in synchronous to each other. So we've got, again, QRS complex. Again, this is focusing primarily on what's occurring in the ventricles. Um, we do have the uh, atrial uh, plot here. But again, we've got our QRS complex or the big electrical event that depolarizes the ventricles. And then we see the pressure generation. If we have situations where we lose function in the conduction system, it will have major ramifications on the ability for the heart to pump effectively. And conversely, if we have damage to cardiac muscle, you can think of mechanical tissue um, or even the conduction system, right? 
it'll also affect the properties of a heart. This makes more sense. We start getting into arrhythmias and dysrhythmias, but I want to introduce this concept that these things are linked and we, we want them to be linked and coordinated. And again, uh, this is a relationship again between electrical and mechanical activity. The electrical event, action potential, precedes the mechanical or contractile event. And again, we call this term electromechanical coupling. Electromechanical coupling. We want these these events to be coordinated. You know, again, think of the conduction system as the computer system that controls the heart. Like you have a computer system that controls your car or other different other, other different things you might have seen. If that's there, if there's problems with the computer, there's gonna be problems with the with the with the machinery. Okay, so uh, that is a cardiac conduction cycle. Again, just really focusing primarily on um, again those key events. Know the the net direction and and a key 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 ions that are moving between phase four through you know zero one two three eight four. Okay, so uh, with that. I will end here and then we'll move on to our next section.